All right, good evening everyone. Andrew here uh, with another update video on Hurricane Dorian, now a extremely dangerous Category 5 hurricane that is uh, just devastating the uh, northern islands of the Bahamas tonight. Uh, made landfall earlier on uh, the Great Abaco Island or the Northern Abaco Island as a Category 5 hurricane with maximum sustained winds of 185 miles per hour um, with gusts over 200 miles per hour and actually tied the uh, Atlantic Basin record for the most intense landfalling um, hurricane in terms of wind speed with uh, the Labor Day hurricane back in 1935. So a very tremendous uh, system here. You can clearly see on satellite imagery. It is one of the most uh, terrifying and uh, strangely beautiful things you'll ever see with the weather. It's so symmetrical, which indicates a very healthy storm. Also a very terrifying loop for these islands. You can see it just slowly crawling across the Bahamas here. A very, uh, very dangerous situation for them. Uh, very populated islands entering the eastern part of Grand Bahama Island now. Um, and it's just been lingering here for the past several hours. Expected to pile up a lot of water along the uh, coast of these islands and then uh, dump a lot of rain in addition to the uh, very intense uh, major hurricane winds of over 180 miles per hour with gusts to 225. And to that point, I want to jump over to an update advisory that the Hurricane Center issued. Just a tremendous statement. You will rarely see these in your um, in your lifetime. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this is from the National Hurricane Center out of Miami, Florida uh, at 9 p.m. Catastrophic Category 5 Dorian continues to batter across the Abacos eye nearing eastern end of end of Grand Bahama Island. <clears throat> it's a life-threatening situation. Residents in the Abacos should continue to stay in their shelter as the northern eye wall of Dorian remains over the area. Um, same same goes for areas in the Grand Bahama Island. Um, but there's always a hazards tag whenever there's a warning or something issued by the National Weather Service, and this is just surreal. Um, hazards with wind gusts over 220 miles per hour and storm surge of 18 to 23 feet above normal tide levels with higher destructive waves. So your heart just really goes out to, to those people down in the Bahamas um, and a very long night ahead and uh, actually along several hours ahead as Dorian is expected to just kind of linger there and um, cause a lot of problems. So uh, you, you know you worry yourself with what you'll find with the light of day um, tomorrow when the sun comes up, but that's the only guarantee that the sun will come up and hopefully damage is at a minimum uh, and the, the loss of, of infrastructure and um, hopefully the loss of life has kept to a very low minimum and people heeded warnings and took shelter. Um, but but off of, of that note, uh, jumping back here, you can see Dorian still a very healthy storm, category five storm. These very dark colors indicate very cold cloud tops and uh, the interaction with land, you know, these islands in the Bahamas are not very elevated. I think the maximum elevation over these is about 40 feet. So maybe like uh, that's kind of akin to the Outer Banks with like Jockey's Ridge State Park, if you've ever been there. I think Jockey's Ridge actually reaches a height of about 90 feet. So this is not the kind of land interaction that's going to weaken the storm, but it is, um, you know, certainly something to watch. So uh, it is kind of induced something we call an eyewall replacement cycle, which seems to be going on. So um, Dorian has not undergone an eyewall replacement uh, cycle in its lifetime yet, and hopefully that will uh, lead to some weakening. What that means is that there's an outer eyewall, and I'll show this better on radar in a moment and explain it a little bit better as well. Um, it actually causes the storm to kind of reform itself in its eye wall, and it can cause the storm to temporarily weaken, but as a result, it usually broadens the overall scope of the storm and causes it to expand. So that's something we'll have to watch as well. Of course, if it expands and it comes very close to the Florida coastline as expected and forecast, that expands the hurricane force wind field even greater. So for all those Florida interest, if I um, pull out the the drawing tool here, uh, you know, th that still doesn't, not out of the woods yet. If, if Dorian continues on this track as expected and just kind of lingers and then comes out to here, you know, hurricane force winds would be anywhere within this uh, large area of very intense thunderstorm activity in this area. So, you know, you have your hurricane force winds, so 74 miles per hour or greater. Um, you know, if the eye, if the center of the circulation is in this area, those hurricane force winds may very well be affecting the east coast of Florida. So the eye doesn't have to make a landfall to have major impacts. And of course, rain is a heavy rain is still going to be likely with that as well. So we have to uh, keep keep a watch on Dorian. Um, and to that point, uh, I will, I'm actually going to come back to the satellite loop when I talk about the track because there's some interesting things we can see on satellite uh, in the short term that may have impact on Dorian's track in the long term, but I want to move along here um, and keep talking about the impact. So down here, this is uh, the Coastal Emergency Risks Assessment, and uh, this shows your storm surge or your maximum water height. So you can see these uh, red purplish colors 
up to a 10 feet of inundation. And this is basically just a storm surge model that is uh, put on with the co collaboration between uh, Louisiana State University, uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and several other entities. Uh, you, uh, Homeland Security works on this as well. And here's the current, uh, this is actually a little bit outdated. It's, there's a bit of a, a lag here, I guess, to account for the, uh, the modeling purposes, but Dorian is actually about where this point is here. And um, uh, so imagine this being here, but it, the model ran when, when it had the information of where Dorian was here a couple of hours ago. Um, but all of these, these warm colors indicating a lot of water piling up because again, if you have the storm, you know, right in here, you're still going to have water piling up because the water, the flow is actually coming out of the north right here um, on that side. And then down here, the water is being pushed eastward toward the southern part of Abaco Island. So you have a lot of interesting geography here that causes a lot of uh, this side of the island is actually kind of not in a safe zone. There's nowhere safe in a Category 5 hurricane. But down here, what I'm referring to is actually in a unique position to where effects may be minimized. Uh, because the the current position of the winds are blowing across the island and actually evacuating water from the coast. So that's um, good news for the town of, of Freetown, Baintown, Freeport, High Rock, and uh, this part of Grand Bahama is a little less uh, populated. But then, uh, you know, down into here, if Dorian does drift a bit you know, farther south or comes over here, then you start getting on the back end where you can have some water pushing up against. But it's all relative to the position of the center of circulation where the water is being pushed up against there. So kind of an interesting impact with that. Um, but I do want to show you this, and <clears throat> this model is uh, showing this for these two Bahaman islands, but also even along the Florida coast with the storm coming up here, you're seeing these warm colors. And don't take this verbatim. This does not mean that, uh, you know, seven feet of water uh, or inundation is expected along the coast. This is just a model forecast based on where the hurricane is currently at. And you can see, you know, if the storm is following this track again, if it's coming up this way and the center of circulation is right in here, you know, you have water being pushed up against the coast as the storm is approaching, and that could cause that coastal flooding, even if the storm does not make a landfall. Once the storm passes, it's evacuating that water out because the winds are blowing from the west to the east on the south side of the center of circulation. So uh, that creates kind of an in interesting uh, influx of water ahead of the storm, and then after the storm, that water kind of gets pulled away. So that's something we have to watch as Dory continues its trek and trace up the southeast coast, uh, just how much water is actually going to be uh, piled up against the coast here. You can see some of these forecasts do, you know, have it a little more intense. And that's something we have to keep in mind, uh, depending on the exact, you know, the precise track of Dorian depends a lot on what kind of impacts we see. And I'm going to kind of go up the coast here and I'll talk about North Carolina impacts in just a few minutes because I know that's what the most of you are likely interested in. Jumping over to the radar view, uh, radar is the most reliable way we can see the storm because it is the uh, satellite can have a bit of a tendency to be misleading because the satellite are up uh, linked up with Earth's equator and they're geostationary satellites, so they're a little bit farther south and uh, they're looking kind of northward into the Atlantic Ocean. So the radar uh, can account for some of those errors. That that discrepancy is sometimes referred to as parallax or P A R A L L A. X, I think I spelled that correctly, um, that is referring to that discrepancy. So radar is the most efficient way, an accurate way to pinpoint the current location of the storm. And again, here is uh, Grand Bahama Island that I'm going to highlight here in this magenta color. So Grand Bahama Island right in here. And the uh, the eye of Dorian is currently approaching the eastern side of that island. There's a lot of K, uh, K islands down here. Um, and that is where the storm currently is. It started this morning about right here and crossed Abaco Island and is now here. So it's creeping along at about five miles per hour. Um, something we have to really start watching here is just when Dorian will start to slow down and begin its uh, turn toward the north because that is critical in determining how, you know, what trajectory it finally takes up the coast. I've mentioned in last night's video a lot. This is a game of inches, a game of miles. If, if the storm is moving just one mile per hour faster than modeled, over 24 hours, that results in a 24 mile error um, because you're moving at one mile per hour. And if it's moving faster than modeled, the model position is going to be 24 miles east of where the actual storm is. So that's something to keep in mind. This, there's very, it's a very sensitive forecast, sensitive to a lot of different moving parts. So here on Florida, the National Hurricane Center has gone ahead and issued uh, hurricane warnings because hurricane conditions are expected along these areas still. And some people were kind of caught off guard by that. but. Florida was always in the cone. There was never uh, any 
confidence that Florida was going to be completely unscathed by this storm. So no matter how soon it takes this northward turn, if it's, you know, overnight and starts bearing this way, if it continues to go all the way across the island and then starts to turn, then eastern Florida is going to be placed in the hurricane force wind. So uh, there's still a waiting game here, and, and I want to erase this area down here. I think the areas south of, um, or areas of, you know, Homestead and south, so uh, areas that were hit hardest by Andrew several years ago, um, are, are out of this one because Dorian is not going to drift farther south, but um, everywhere in you know this area here still needs to be on alert for um, hurricane conditions. So that's something we have to watch on radar to see what exactly Dorian is doing. <clears throat> and um, to kind of echo that, I want to jump over here to the, the official track. It has not it has not actually changed from the Hurricane Center um, because there's been some model guidance that's shown one uh, instance in tracking back further to the west toward the coast. Some has pushed it farther out to sea. Again, it's it's kind of a moot point to look at one model run. There's going to be hundreds more model runs before the storm actually gets to the Carolinas on between Thursday and Friday. Um, the main point is to realize that anywhere within this cone is where the center of the storm could be within five days. The impacts are not limited to the cone, though. So if the center of Dorian is in this area come you know Thursday afternoon, then the forecast was very accurate and the impacts are probably you know limited to to this zone here but if dorian uh doesn't turn as quickly and kind of uh deviates from the track and takes a more westward westward track and the center is here you know impacts may extend all the way up into the charlotte metro area and the, and the triad um, up into you know central parts of virginia having tropical storm force wind gusts and heavier rain so uh, again a game of inches a game of miles with this storm and very small fluctuations in the track can result in very large differences in impact uh, jumping over to the uh, earliest wind arrival, a lot of people have asked, you know, what what does it look, what is it going to look like when the storm uh, passes by here or gets here on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? So the main day for Thursday, or I'm sorry, the main day for North Carolina impacts are going to be on Thursday. So um, you see this earliest reasonable arrival time of tropical storm force winds, which is 39 miles per hour or greater, um, or 40 miles per hour or greater, I guess. So, you know, North Carolina being right here, that earliest arrival time is going to be uh, early on Wednesday. Things could start to be quite breezy. You notice, you know, the trees swing around a lot more. But then earlier into a Wednesday evening and in, into Thursday is when the sustained winds may pick up to, you know, 10 to 15 miles per hour, perhaps up to 25 miles per hour. And the closer to the coast you are, uh, logically, it's going to be worse if you follow that, you know, logic. The closer to the coast you are with this storm, the windier it's going to be, the more rain you're going to get. The only silver lining to this forecast is that Dorian is expected to accelerate once it gets near our area here in North Carolina. So it will quickly come by and then quickly go back out to sea. And it's not going to linger like Matthew did. It's not going to linger like Florence did. It's going to come, it's going to impact us, and it's going to move on. So that is a good part of the forecast. It's not going to be a massive flooding situation, but it will be impactful weather. And power outages are very possible because... Uh, you know, our, our energy infrastructure is just not made to, you know, take sustained winds of 45 miles per hour and heavy rain. Um, so that's something we'll have to watch out for. I'm going to zoom into different parts of North Carolina in just a couple of minutes in this uh, live stream update to kind of show exact, exactly, excuse me, exactly what impacts you can expect. But uh, just know that it's not going to be very long lasting. It's going to be fairly quick. And Thursday looks like the worst weather day um, in North Carolina here in terms of actual impacts from Hurricane Dorian. Uh, and then talking on that point, talking about the rainfall, this is the uh, rainfall forecast from the National Hurricane Center, this red color indicating 10 to 15 inches, and you can see that kind of uh, echoes the, the main forecast track as it stays off the coast. But every update, I've seen this red color get a little bit larger in space, excuse me, and I've also seen the, the red color kind of creep farther inland into North Carolina. So now, um, you know, parts of Moorhead City um, down here, some of the barrier islands just east of Wilmington, you know, Topsail Beach up here, Jacksonville, um, you know, Moorhead City, Newport, up into the the southern Outer Banks, um, you know, Ocracoke Island, still in line for, you know, a lot of rain, even though the system will be quick moving, it's going to be where the core of the system is that's expected to pass so closely. So rain is a big deal with this, and you can see this very tight gradient across um, the the eastern North Carolina coastal plain and it's like a snowstorm you hear that gradient word all the time where some people are going to get a lot and then you can drive you know 20 miles and have a lot less 
that's just the nature of the hurricane. You know, it, it tapers off very quickly as you get away from the center of circulation. So uh, we're talking, you know, again, a game of miles in North Carolina where, you know, here in maybe Raleigh area, you could get, you know, maybe an inch of rain or less. And then you go over to Greenville, Goldsboro, you know, Lumberton, uh, down into Wilmington could get upwards of six, upwards of 10 inches potentially with locally heavier amounts if there are heavier rain bands that set up. Again, the good news is that the storm will continue moving, so it's not going to be a Florence where it just sits and produces heavy bands of rain over and over. It's going to come, it's going to drop the rain, it's going to give us gusty winds, and then it's going to move on. So this weekend, we will already be in the clear um, from Dorian's impacts. Down here in the Bahamas, of course, still this terrible situation where a lot of rain's falling um, and just kind of tracing the coast. The storm doesn't know where the southeast coast is. The storm doesn't um, know where the coastline is, so we kind of draw this based on on impacts there's a little bit of a bias with um how do i say this you know we produce the national hurricane center is likely producing this forecast to kind of give the best best scenario but the storm doesn't know where the coastline is it's not going to you know uh, stop just in time to to miss the coastline it's going to go where the storm goes and where the uh, the you know, steering currents in the atmosphere take it so we have to remember that we have to remember that these storms when they get so big and powerful like dorian is it just kind of turns into this uh, monster of a system it has a mind of its own and uh you know it's it's going to kind of do what it, it does until it dissipates and there's a lot of energy to dissipate because um, it is a category five storm and has maintained that intensity for several hours usually when storms reach category five intensity it's very short-lived and it's not a, a prolonged thing but this has now been a category five hurricane maxing out the Saffir Simpson wind scale at 185 mile per hour winds um, for going on 12 hours now. So a very dire situation and something we have to keep watch of um, in the future. And speaking of this, while I have the satellite pulled up, uh, it's beginning to, to catch forecasters attention that Dorian is slipping a little bit farther south than um, expected. This is an interactive track that is on a National Hurricane Center um, forecast and you can click this area here that is warnings and cone interactive map and uh, this there's a lot going on here on this graphic but the main thing I want you to focus on is just this area here where the center of the storm is supposed to be and it's a little bit um, hard to see but Grand Bahama Island would be in this area something like that and it has the center of the storm as of 8 p.m. Um, you know right out here and if we look at the satellite we can kind of zoom in and if I trace a line from where Dorian starts into where it stops, when it resets this loop here, kind of from this area down to this area, that didn't quite draw where I was expecting it to, um, but you know, it's it's almost taking a little bit of a southwestern track. So these wobbles are common. It's not uncommon for the storm to kind of deviate from the track and then get back on and um, kind of wobble and, and do its own thing along the way. It's very it's actually very common for the storm track to kind of um, you know, kind of wobble like this and have kind of kinks and loops and things in it, uh, not loops, but uh, bends in it. So that that's um, that's not uncommon, but it is a little bit a little bit worrying um, to me as as a uh, as a you know person who's seen a lot of these storms. It, you can't just stop the storm on a dime. It's like an ocean liner. <laughs> you know, it's it's very hard to to stop that. So. Uh, you know, that's something we have to keep an eye on when it starts to make that turn. Again, thanks to everyone for moving in. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I read a comment when I said that and uh, said the wrong word. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. I see that several are um, asking now, so I'm going to stop and take a quick break for questions. So Kurt says, uh, when should we expect a noticeable northward turn? It should be sometime overnight tonight. Um, like I just mentioned, uh, it should be occurring very soon. The storm hasn't really slowed down as much as anticipated. It could kind of linger around this area, but uh, it's not been a clear northward turn. That's the key part of the forecast. If it does not make the northward turn by morning, uh, eastern Florida needs to be prepared for rougher conditions than they're currently forecast to be. That's why hurricane warnings are out for um eastern part of Florida down to I think Vero Beach and up to Cape Canaveral some hurt some models uh, are initializing the storm and taking it into Cape Canaveral sometime uh, late uh, late late tomorrow night uh, so overnight Monday into Tuesday um, and taking it to you know Cape Canaveral and having it make a Florida landfall some down in Melbourne up in northern uh, Florida still have it making a Florida landfall so it's it's not out of the question it's a very tricky forecast and it's something we have to to keep 
in mind. So Kurt, there's no good answer to that. It's kind of a, a now cast a wait and see thing. And that's a very critical point that we're all kind of sitting on pins and needles waiting for it to start to make or indicate that it's starting to change direction. Cindy said, my daughter is in Wilmington. Should she evacuate? Not yet. Um, I don't think there is a, if, if it begins to make its northward turn and kind of starts to deviate from the track more, um, I, I think that uh, government officials, I, I entrust them with uh, making the best decisions there. I know the entire coastline of South Carolina in flood prone areas have been ordered to evacuate. And I saw a tweet uh, talking about how I think that's estimated to be about 830,000 people. And in some cases, the evacuation can be uh, more dangerous than just waiting for the storm itself. When you have that many people, uh, I, I believe they're activating the Acontra flow on Interstate 26, which means that both lanes of the interstate, so instead of one lane of the interstate going you know, eastbound or southbound, uh, they turn Contra flow uh, and they order it at a certain time and block off all of the exits and they literally turn both sides of the interstate and uh, they both go inland. So uh, that's one of the very unique things about tropical systems when there is mass evacuation. That's an interesting uh, thing that you may see there. Um, those mandatory evacuations go into noon tomorrow for coastal South Carolina. Um, I'm not authorized to, to issue any evacuation. I would definitely make sure that your daughter, Cindy, is um, aware of the risk and, and knows that if she does not feel safe or she feels worried, I would uh, definitely encourage her to make accommodations and go inland. I know Florence is, is a very raw on the mind of a lot of people down there, so um, I would wait another day or so and make a final decision then. Um, Kurt is eight miles inland at West Palm Beach, Florida. Okay, so you're down in this area. It's very, uh, it's very, <laughs> you're not going to sleep easy tonight knowing that there's a Category 5 hurricane within a what? Let's check the radar here and see just how close um, it is. So West Palm Beach, so currently the storm is 137.5 miles from you. So you're probably not going to sleep very easy tonight knowing that, um, but it is expected to slow down and begin its northward turn. We have to wait and see. So Kurt, to your to your question, you know, I really, uh, it's, it's pretty... It's pretty nerve-wracking, but it is expected to make that northward turn, um, and forecasters will be watching that. And if something does change, I know that the National Hurricane Center will issue an update and you know definitely keep you informed about that. Justin Matthews asks, um, Andrew Emerald Isle, Crystal Coast, hurricane force winds. It's a possibility, so I'm going to go back and jump over to the forecast cone here. Um, so Emerald Isle, um, it, it's very possible. I, I want to... I actually just uh, closed out the tab that I wanted to, to have there. I want to pull up this interactive map and show you that if you overlay the center of the forecast track currently, it brings it very close to, um, to eastern North Carolina. So I wonder if I can get this to look a little bit more transparent. I guess not. Um, but, you know, here's Wilmington down here. The center of the current official forecast track for Dorian brings it you know within well within 50 miles of Cape Fear and then um, down here Cape Lookout and then Cape Hatteras down here so our three capes in North Carolina getting very very close and some uh, some guidance even has it making a landfall in Cape Fear going up through eastern North Carolina into the Pamlico Sound and and out a little bit farther so um, to your to your question Justin I'm gonna actually pull up this here which is a simulated infrared satellite so this is basically guessing what the storm is going to look like on satellite and i want to show you a key part of the forecast that's not i feel like it's not being addressed by the hurricane center when a storm is this powerful and it weakens it expands in size because all of the energy that's pent up inside has to uh, be expended in some way and that is expended by expanding the wind the wind field and making the storm grow in size so if we advance this infrared satellite image which seems to have frozen up on me here. I'm going to quickly refresh it. Uh, it's going to expand in size in order to accommodate for a weakening system. So every time I hit the, uh, the uh, click the mouse here, it's showing a, uh, sorry, that might be why it's fro freezing up if I'm clicking this area here. Let's see here. There we go. So every time it advances here, uh, we're going forward six hours and you can see the storm it's very obvious where the storm is, um, and then it continues to scrape across, scrape the eastern coast of Florida, and it begins growing in size. The, the northern fringe of the storm is kind of drawn up into North Carolina, so this is by 
uh, 12Z Wednesday. So this is early Wednesday morning. You know, the center of the storm could be just southeast of Jacksonville, and then it continues to go up. The storm continues to grow in size, and this northern, what is, what's happening is colliding with a trough out here in the central uh, United States, or eastern United States, I should say, and it's kind of causing the northern part of the system to be drawn out and in here can be very heavy rain bands ahead of the system like with Hurricane Matthew. The eye remained offshore for Matthew but we had a ton of rain in central North Carolina. So Justin to your question with a storm that's going to grow in size because of the energy dissipation of it weakening uh, it's very likely you know this has it coming and making a landfall in the coastal plain of North Carolina. This is from the global forecast system um, so the GFS, the American model. So a North Carolina landfall is not out of question. It is in this cone of uncertainty. Um, this, you know, that is not out of the question that a, a uh, North Carolina landfall is expected. It's expected to do so as a strength of a hurricane, um, which well, it is a hurricane. I'm, what I meant to say as a category two hurricane. Um, so it's going to weaken substantially before it gets here. And that's certain just because it's going to travel so far north into cooler waters and when the storm is nearly stationary like it is right now, it's drawing up all of the, the warm water and being used for um, intensification, intensification of the storm. And then it taps into the cooler waters at uh, depths of the ocean. So it, if it stays in the same spot for too long, it actually causes itself to weaken. So we'll hope that it begins to weaken shortly. And as it crosses over the Gulf Stream into a little bit cooler waters here in the, the um, continental shelf of North America, it should weaken quite a bit. But this is just to show that the storm's going to grow in size and therefore impacts could be felt very far inland. Um, Teresa, Jennifer, uh, Jordan, Cindy, uh, Beth, thank you all for joining. Uh, fingers crossed for Palm Beach. Yes, uh, hopefully there are minimal impacts from that. So if you have any questions, feel free to comment. I'm just going to start winding down here with a couple of final thoughts. In terms of North Carolina conditions, I've shared this last year during Florence and I'll share it again. There's a great app you can download called readync.org that is run by North Carolina Emergency Management. And uh, that is a great app to download. It doesn't hurt to, it's free to download. It doesn't hurt to have it on your phone no matter what. It can um, it can be a little bit clunky at times and a little bit slow if um, a lot of people are using the interface, but it's great to have uh, to look at current weather conditions, uh, traffic, you know, the big deal with, with Hurricane Florence was how many uh, roads it knocked out, over 1,200 roads in North Carolina. Um, power outages, you know, and, and a lot of great information on this app. So download it. It's readync.org. I think you can just search readync in the App Store or Google Play or um, whatever, you know, means of getting apps you use. Definitely something to add to your uh, mobile device or your smartphone. Um, download this app and put it on your phone if you are a resident of uh, North Carolina. I think that's very very important to do. Justin, uh, thanks. Absolutely. Um, you, that's one luxury of, of not being part of a hey, TV entity or something. I can give a little more individual attention. So if you have further questions outside of this broadcast, feel free to message me, uh, tweet me uh, at Andrew WX Center on Twitter, and uh, I will try to address your question the best I can, or I'll find someone who can help you. Um, because, you know, with such a, a strong storm, it causes a lot of storm anxiety, and there's a lot a lot of information being thrown around, so it can be quite overwhelming at times. So I want to, I think that was about all I had planned. I wanted to pull up two graphics here before I wrapped up. And this was a graphic from the uh, briefing from the National Weather Service in Raleigh earlier this morning. So there's a lot of words here, so just uh, pay attention to the colors right now. So this red track would be worse, uh, the worst, I should say, for Central North Carolina. Um, moderate to perhaps bands of heavy rain, moderate to perhaps heavy bands of rain is what that should say, which could lead to localized poor drainage flooding as the storm moves through. Um, the orange track, which is currently the forecast track, uh, coastal North Carolina would get hit pretty hard with a lot of impacts. Uh, Wilmington, Cape Lookout, Cape Hatteras, all having storm surge from the storm. Uh, that is when the ocean literally, you know, kind of creeps up onto the shore because the storm is pushing water up against the coastline uh, you have heavy rain and then you have the hurricane force winds and a lot of this depends on how how much dorian weakens before it gets to north carolina it could maintain its strength it's kind of defied the odds you know if i go back to the satellite image you know i've i've seen a lot of hurricanes and i've never seen one quite this scary for this long it's maintained its category 5 intensity for over 12 hours now or right at 12 hours so um, that's certainly something concerning with it interacting with land, with it tapping into um, 
with it slowing down, it's, it's reaching the, that colder water and it should begin to start weakening. So uh, some, something we have to watch, but this satellite image is certainly something you don't want to see when you wake up in the morning because the storm is just kind of defying the forecast at that point, And that's something we have to keep an eye on. Um, jumping back to this graphic though, uh, hopefully it gets pulled back out to see uh, if certain steering currents are stronger or weaker than impact or than forecast, the impacts will be lower along the coast and we really won't get much more than a breezy day and maybe a couple of scattered rain showers. The orange track, more uh, coastal problems, even the coastal plain of North Carolina getting a lot of rain and then red uh, indicating where the heaviest rain could impact central North Carolina. And uh, to kind of put that graphically, this is a graphic from WRAL in Raleigh where uh, this pink shade is, you know, hurricane force winds possible, some flooding is possible, storm surge, of course. If your county has a coastline, I would be preparing now for hurricane force impacts. Um, that's what the forecast is currently looking like. Uh, strong tropical storm force winds in this red zone. So anywhere east of Interstate 95 and then east of Interstate 1 or uh, U.S. Highway 1, I should say. Uh, tropical storm force winds are possible, some flash flooding. Triad, I really don't think you're you're in on this. You may get some some rain and some wind, but unless Dorian kind of really uh, just gets farther inland than expected, I think you you will be excluded from any impacts from any impactful weather. You're, you're still going to feel Dorian. You'll you'll see the clouds outside. You'll feel it, uh, but you won't have any adverse weather impacts from it. Uh, Mindy, of course. Justin, absolutely. Uh, Teresa, sure thing. Um, so thanks to everyone for tuning in. I'm going to wrap it up here because my computer is exhausted from me opening so many tabs. So I'm going to end the broadcast here. It's been about 31 and a half minutes, it looks like. So if you have any questions, feel free to ping me on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, I will do another update video tomorrow, maybe during the day. I know it's Labor Day, so a lot of people will probably be grilling out. Labor Day is going to be beautiful tomorrow. Uh, still hot and muggy, but beautiful in terms of relative to the impacts we'll see from Dorian on Wednesday through Friday, as seen in this graphic, with Thursday being the worst weather day in North Carolina. Um, you know, I will try to do an update as well and uh, just kind of touch base and see what Dorian's doing. We'll see what it does overnight. Uh, send your thoughts out to the Bahamas because they're getting absolutely devastated by this storm. And uh, we will see what Dorian does and we will see what the future holds and uh, how this storm writes its way into the history books. So, uh, thank you everyone for tuning in and remember to stay safe, be smart. Don't, um, listen to emergency officials for evacuation orders. I know someone had asked about that. I think it was Cindy. Um, uh, you know, just listen, heed, heed warnings If hurricane warnings are issued for the North Carolina coast. Make sure you heed those warnings and do what you think is best. Do what uh, you think is smartest and be safe and, uh, always be kind to one another. These storms can be very stressful. And uh, everyone is under a lot of stress with these storms and can be kind of on high alert. So uh, be kind to one another and take care of each other and be safe. And I will see you on another video update. Thanks for watching.